Um, why don't we open our Bibles or phones to Romans 12? That's where we're going to be reading from tonight. Romans 12, 1 to 2. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. I love this passage, and I think often we can look at this scripture and we jump straight to the word mind, and we just get into action stations and go, right, okay, Paul is talking about our minds here. I need to make sure I'm thinking the right things, I've got the mind of Christ, I have good thought patterns, and I'm all about that. If you have friends with me, you will have heard me talk about training your brain a billion times, and I probably will get into that later, but Paul is saying more than just that. Notice at the start of this verse, it says, therefore, and because of the way our Bibles are structured, we often read just in these chapters that are marked out for us. And there's a little title, so we just read what's under the title or the number or whatever. And because of that, we actually sometimes end up losing a bit of the context. And I've had it drilled into me over um, my life that when there's a therefore, that's a big red flashing light. Why, what is the therefore, therefore? Um, so we have to look before it. Um, to get some context. So I'm going to do that now um, because I think we miss a lot if we don't figure out why Paul has said therefore. So if we go back to Romans 11, there's this incredible doxology. Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay him? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. When we read it in the context of this doxology that Paul has given us, it fills it out so much more. Because otherwise, we just see Paul telling us to offer our bodies as a living sacrifice, and it's kind of for no reason. But when we see what he's talking about before, it makes sense. And this is not a relaxed suggestion. He says, I urge you. He's urging his readers, he's urging us to offer our entire lives as a living sacrifice. He doesn't say, offer three songs on a Sunday night. He doesn't say, offer 10 minutes of Bible reading a day or your prayer before bed. He says, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. And I think this is what Jesus meant and the gospel writers meant when they said that following Jesus costs us something. Because the idea of sacrifice is not super fun. And it doesn't translate as effectively in our culture because we don't really do sacrifice. I've never taken an animal to a temple and sacrificed it. And I don't know if you have either, but I don't know what that's like. But his readers, Paul's readers, were very familiar with this. And they would have had a very tangible sense of what a sacrifice was. And Paul is painting a really vivid graphic picture here that we would offer our whole self on the altar like a sacrifice in the temple. The readers of this text, the original hearers of this text, they would have heard it, not read it. They would be familiar with this language of death and dying to self and sacrifice that we hear about a lot in the Bible. And it's just not something we're used to and not something we particularly enjoy talking about. The difference between sacrifice in the context of um, the Greco-Roman Roman world that this um, passage was, would have been circulated around and what Paul's actually talking about here is radical because a sacrifice is killed, that's the point. But for the Christian, the sacrifice is about life. Theologian N.T. Wright says, the Christian's self-offering is actually all about coming alive with the new life that bursts out in unexpected ways once the evil deeds of the self are put to death. And Paul is saying that we need to offer ourselves 
after this incredible proclamation of the character of God. For from him and through him and for him are all things. And he is just desperate for us all to realize the greatness of God and to see that the only appropriate offering is our entire lives in worship. He's not asking for a little bit. He's asking for it all. So Paul starts all the way up here going, look at how amazing our God is. Look at what he's done. Look at this incredible, he is unsearchable. We would, we'll never comprehend him. And then he zooms in a little bit more and goes, because of that, because of all of this and how amazing he is, we need to offer our whole selves because that's the only worthy offering. And then he zooms in a little bit more and says, but actually, this world is really hard to live in. And it could be really easy to be shaped by it, so you need to be transformed and renewed. So after urging us to offer our bodies as a living sacrifice, he goes on to say, do not conform to the pattern of this world. The Passion Translation says, stop imitating the ideals and opinions of the culture around you, but be inwardly transformed by the Holy Spirit through a total reformation of how you think. The Message Translation says, don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. I find it helpful to look at a couple of different translations because it seems to broaden it. And when I've, you can see that when we've done it with this passage, it moves from more than just the mind that needs transforming. It's not purely a cognitive thing. It's a total reformation of how you think. That's got to have some pretty extreme implications for it to be a total reformation. Don't let yourselves be squeezed into the shape dictated by the present age. The present age is over here, whispering and convincing and seducing and sometimes shouting, advertising, grabbing at our attention, sometimes without us even realizing. And it's going, hey, this is way easier. Think, think like this, have these thought patterns, do things in this way, live your life in this way. But if we're a Christian, if you've chosen to follow God, we're not part of this present age, we're part of the age to come. The age that began breaking in when Jesus came to this earth and has continued to break in since then. So in order to live in a way that brings this age in and brings his kingdom to earth, we need to be transformed <clears throat> and renewed. So Paul says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Yes, I love it. I want my mind to be transformed big time. But it can't just stop there. Be transformed by the renewing of your loves, your desires, your goals, your ambitions, a total reformation of your innermost parts. When Paul urges us to offer our bodies as living sacrifices, he is meaning our whole selves, not just our mind. James K.A. Smith is a philosopher and theologian, and he says, Jesus is a teacher who doesn't just inform our intellect, but forms our very loves. He isn't content to simply deposit new ideas into your mind. He is after nothing less than your wants, your loves, your longings. That's hard. That's a lot that he wants from us. But it's what he offers in return is so much more. St. Augustine, he has shaped the way that we think um, in a lot of our theology, and he places this important on our hearts. You have made us for yourself, and our heart is restless until it rests in you. Our heart is restless until it rests in you. Like what Paul says in his doxology in Romans before we get to this therefore bit, humans are made by and for and through the creator. So to be fully human, to live fully in the way that God wants us to live, we need to find ourselves in relationship with him. Our hearts need to find rest in him. More important than the renewal of simply the mind, I think, is the renewal of our heart. Our heart, that's where our wants and our longings and our desires form, and they quickly become the core of who we are. And it's from there that our actions and our behavior flows. So what do you love? Being a disciple is about paying attention and being intentional about what you love. It's about curating your heart and rightly ordering your desires. 
And it's this culture around us, the culture that Paul warns us about very strongly, that ends up driving our loves. We're being oriented in certain directions without even realizing it. And it's found in the obvious things. It's found in the job that we're chasing after, the, the social media stuff you've heard about a thousand times, the perfect salary, the friend group, the clothes, all these obvious things. I don't need to tell you those distractions that end up becoming uh, unrightly disordered. And none of this is foreign. And it's pretty, it's pretty easy to think that we're on top of it. Uh, but our loves are deeper and are more subtle. Whatever your heart clings to and confides in, that is really your God. Wherever you run to and confide in. So when you stop and think about it, what do you really love? Because I know I love God, but what else do I love? And what order am I putting those things? I had to do this myself as I was preparing, because I was like, I can't get up here and talk about it if I haven't sorted myself out a little bit. So I did some careful thought, I did some journaling, and it was hard, but I started to realize I definitely had heaps of disordered loves. My love of praise and recognition, and how that drives and motivates a lot of what I do. My love of being liked by people, and how, that, how controlling that is in my relationships. My love of my talents, like the list just goes on. And when I look at those things, and then I look at what James K. Smith said, uh, when he said, you are what you love, that didn't leave me super stoked because I was looking at this list of things that I loved, and then I was, I don't want to be those things. If you are what you love, that's not what I want to be. I was letting pride and other people and the culture around me direct my loves. So what are you letting direct your loves? As humans, we're all driven and oriented towards this certain vision of the good life. And because of the wandering nature of our hearts, we can so often stray from the picture of the good life that Jesus gives us. And because of what we end up filling our minds with, we kind of forget the picture of the good life that Jesus has given us. And what makes it even more difficult is that the pathway that he's given us to get to this isn't necessarily an easy one. The wide and narrow path. The culture's definitely offering the wide, smooth, well-trodden path. Within your vision of the good life, you will have made decisions about lots of things, and you may not even realize uh, these decisions that you've made, but you will have made decisions about what good relationships look like, about finances and how they should be handled and where we should put our money and what we should do with it, how a family should operate, our values and our families what recreation and hobbies and fun you value, how we're supposed to relate to nature, what work should look like, and what place work should have in our lives. And there's plenty of other things you would have made decisions about. And all of these things govern and motivate our actions. The vision of the good life that is kind of in your subconscious, it's not something we are actively thinking about all the time, but it does govern what we do, and it governs what we love. Within your vision of the good life comes this list of things to tick off, and you haven't made it unless you've followed these things. And I know that there's, this list is going to look different for everyone, but there's, you, know, you go to university, you find yourself a good group of friends, you land the perfect job, you get in the rat race of the corporate life, you work your way up to a decent salary, you find the perfect person, you get married, you, after, you date for two years, sorry, date for two years, then you get married. Uh, and then after you're married, you top it off with a couple of kids, you look good all the time, you go on a great holiday that looks really aesthetic on Instagram, and then you're sorted, and you've clocked life. And your list might look different from that. I may be coming from a biased point of view there. But we all have a list. We all have a list that we think we need to tick through. And that's, that is bondage, really. To be honest, that's bondage, to feel like we have to tick off these things in a list. And I don't think that's what Jesus wants for us. And it's really easy to get fixated on this list. And again, probably without realizing we just go and go and go and go. We are told, be busy, do more. Always be doing something. Always be bettering yourself, succeeding. And we don't often stop long enough to go, hang on, am I even heading in the right direction? We create these super ingrained habits in our life that have us on this trajectory. 
And we often don't stop long enough to listen to that small, still, quiet voice inside of us that is convicting us. Do we stop and let God convict us on more than just the big decisions? It's really easy to say, no, 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 I let God, I let God speak into my life when I'm changing my job or deciding to marry someone. But maybe not about the day-to-day -day things, the things that make up 90% of who we are and shape us. So we have this vision of the good life, and we have these deep loves in our hearts that are driving us towards it. And we take a step back from that, we have our habits. What we spend our time doing reflects what we love. And when you hear the word habit, your mind may instantly jump to just bad habits that you can pick up, like biting your nails or something like that. But I just want to broaden it and simplify it to just anything that you repeat. And some of them are things we intentionally do. We've chosen to do them and put them into our lives. And some of them we do without realizing, and they just kind of happen. And these habits are an indication of what we love. And what we love shows what we think a good, flourishing life looks like. It's our habits and loves that need to be offered to God for renewal. Our habits are the hinge that turn our heart into different directions. There aren't many neutral habits. Everything we do is shaping and pushing us towards a certain end. I don't want you to switch off as you realize that the answer to this is habits and discipline. I know that that sucks. <laughs> and I know that's probably something you've heard a thousand times. But I know for me, I kind of uh, realized the importance of habits about three years ago. And I can't really say much has changed. And I need to keep hearing it. So that's why I'm drilling it in again. So as an example, maybe you go running three times a week. That's a habit. You may not realize what desire is driving that habit and what vision of the good life is driving it. So it could be that you want to look a certain way and be a certain weight. Or it could be that you really want to honor the body that God gave you and to keep, look after it and keep it fit and keep it healthy. Two different versions of the good life there. And this is why God wants us to offer our whole selves as a living sacrifice. All of our habits are trying to make us into a certain person. And this is why we need transformation. Ask yourself this question. And this might be a question that you want to ask yourself as you go about the week as well. As you think of the habits in your life, what kind of person is this habit trying to produce? And to what end is this habit aimed? What direction is this pushing me in? What you do reflects what you love. Is your love misdirected? The heart is like a compass. It's going to go. We don't have control over it. It's going to attach itself to things. And we need to regularly recalibrate our hearts, turning them to be directed to the creator, to our true magnetic north. We need to teach our hearts what to love in order to be transformed and experience a total reformation of how we think. So how do we do this? By placing a new vision of the good life in front of our eyes by giving our heart something pure and good to attach itself to and orient itself towards, by immersing ourselves in scripture and by imitating Christ. Our desires and loves need renewal but, and transformation, but formation requires work and it requires more than a podcast, more than a couple of hours at church on a Sunday night. It requires more than 10 minutes of Bible reading. That's not going to change you. I'm sorry, I wish it did. I, I really wish it did, but it doesn't. And when you've moved out of home in a flatting, like a lot of us here tonight are, it requires a lot of intentionality because there's no one there setting up your habits or guiding, you, or guiding them. No one's directing your loves. It's up to you, and it's hard work. And I've given you, already I've given you a lot to think about. And it can feel pretty overwhelming to have to address all these things and analyze these things in your life. And I know that as I've been doing it, I've kind of felt like God has created a building site out of my heart and life. And I've asked them to, but it's still chaotic. And when you're in the middle of it, it can be confusing and difficult. C.S. Lewis sums up why I think it feels like this. Imagine yourself as a living house. God comes in to rebuild that house. At first, perhaps, you can understand what he's doing. He's getting the drains right and stopping the leaks in the roof and so on. You knew that those jobs needed doing, so you're not surprised. 
But presently, he starts knocking the house about in a way that hurts and does not seem to make any sense. What on earth is he up to? The explanation is that he is building quite a different house from the one you thought of. Throwing out a new wing here, putting on an extra floor there, running up towers, making courtyards. You thought you were being made into a decent little cottage, but he is building a palace. He intends to come and live in it himself. He's building quite a different house from the one you thought of, and he tends to do that. We have this life in mind. We think things are gonna go a certain way, and God comes along and goes, hey, have you thought maybe we should do things this way? And sometimes he does that, like I just did it, like quite gentle and quiet, and sometimes he just comes along with a megaphone and a bulldozer, like it's an episode of Extreme Makeover. But he has a palace in mind, and don't forget that. Don't forget that while it takes work and it's hard and things are being knocked out and built and there's hammers and it's awful and it's noisy, but he's building a palace because he wants to come and dwell in it. So what is Jesus' vision of the good life? How did he live his life and how did the early church do it? By gathering, listening, eating together, confessing to one another and living in community. Gathering, listening, eating together, confessing to one another, and living in community. We need to immerse ourselves in Scripture so that we can get to know the person of Jesus and the character of God in order to imitate him. If imitating him is what transforms us and recalibrates our hearts, we need to know him. And immersion is what does that. And it's not just quickly skimming. It's diving deep into the story and spending time there. Eugene Peterson was the author of the Message Translation, and he said, we should consume scripture like a lozenge in our mouth, slowly letting it melt, tasting it, letting it sink in. A good way to immerse yourself is to just get the whole sweep of scripture rather than reading it in little chunks. And so you might decide that you're just gonna focus on one book. Maybe, it, what is it, October, October. You could do that for the rest of this year, just one book, and that might sound horrible and it will get boring, but that is how we know it. That's how we know the story intimately. And our hearts aren't captured by a set of rules or a whole bunch of information. Our hearts are captured by stories that show us what it's like to flourish and commune with God. And the Bible is filled with these stories. You'll be surprised at what happens to your heart when you stop approaching the Bible purely for practical life advice. If the only reason you're reading it is to get some warm fuzzies and encouragement for what's going on in your world. You're missing out on so much. You're not getting transformed. You're just getting the Bible to reinforce what you're thinking and feeling. Approaching the Bible to, when you think it was written many years ago and we approach it to get specific advice on this specific circumstance in our lives and we get fed up if we don't find it. That's, God does want to be involved in the details of our lives. And scripture is alive and active, and it can speak to the details in our lives, but it also does more than that. That's not the sole purpose. If you approach it to simply read the story, to be taken into the world where Jesus walked, to know the characters, to imagine what it was like, it takes off so much pressure. It takes off pressure that we need to learn something really concrete, but it gives us freedom to just know God to know the character of him, to know Jesus and be able to be more like him. The, um, the Holy Spirit is what does that. That's what does the work of transformation. And he's not just going to do that on his own accord. We have to make room. We have to do our bit. Memorization of small pieces of scripture is another great way to immerse yourself. In Psalms it says, I have hidden your word in my heart that I may not sin against you. How do we hide the word in our hearts? We memorize it so that we can call on it in those times of need. As humans, we've always been aware of the strength of our heart and the strength of our loves to attach itself to things and charge in different directions. Robert Robinson was 22 when he wrote these words in the hymn, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing, in 1757. Let thy goodness, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord. Take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. I've found that becoming my prayer as I've been preparing for tonight. 
A fetter is a, pla a chain placed around the ankles of a prisoner. It's like a shackle. It's big, it's strong, and Robert Robinson is saying here, that's what we need. We need that much strength to stop our hearts from wandering from God. We cannot do this on our own, and we're in luck because Jesus knew that, and he sorted some things out for us. Firstly, he modeled it. He showed us how to structure our lives. He spent time in community. He spent a lot of time eating and drinking with his friends and having meaningful conversation. If that's what he's asking me to do, so be it, I surrender. Like, I can do that, we can all do that. But he didn't just do it for the sake of it. They had hard conversations. They had real conversations. What would it look like for us to be a community that did that, that ate together and drank together and really talked about life and what it means to be a follower? We can do that. He went off on his own quite a bit. He had a lot of time in solitude, a lot of time in silence. And this one's a little harder than the eating and drinking together. And it's hard in this present age. We don't have much quiet. It's busy. But he went off. And time, time to, to pray, to be in full communion with the Trinity. He had time to recalibrate his heart. And the other thing Jesus did for us was send the Holy Spirit. The Spirit does the work of renewal. I know that I'm kind of giving you all these things that you need to do, but it's not our work. It's the Holy Spirit. We form the habits, we create space, we posture ourselves, but the Holy Spirit comes in and does the work of transformation. The Holy Spirit transforms our hearts and our minds and our desires and our longings. So what is your vision of the good life? Does it line up with the way Jesus lived and the way he said we should live? Are you even aware of what your vision of the good life is? Maybe the step for you is to start to evaluate that, to start to evaluate what you're working towards. What does your heart truly love? What direction is your heart pushing you? Are you being swept up by the loves that this culture is screaming at us or whispering to us? Or are you focusing your attention on the things of the kingdom? What kind of person are your habits producing? Really think about it. What do you spend your time doing? There's a lot to think about here, and I just want to take us back to our passage to ground us and remind us why we're doing this. Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay them? For from him and through him and for him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. I've read that so many times in the past week, and just reading it now, I'm like struck again. I'm just like, oh, it's just amazing. Like, we need to be excited about this. It's incredible what God has done for us. And I've saved the best bit for last. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Why? I don't even know why we get to do that. I don't see how we're worthy to even be able to do that. When you get your vision of the good life aligned with his, you get your loves driving you towards his kingdom. You create habits in your life that form you in that direction. You recalibrate your heart with his. Your life is aligned with his. Your will is aligned with his. You're that much closer to the heart of God and the things of God. Your discernment is that much more in line with the things of God. And tonight it starts with surrender. Will you offer your whole self to him as a living sacrifice? I'm not gonna water it down or put pretty flowers around this. It's a big commitment. 
and I've only scratched the surface with you tonight. You can go home and figure out your habits and your loves and analyze your vision of the good life and pull things apart and what are you spending your time doing and what new habits can you create. But before any of that, you need to recalibrate your heart with his to reset your heart to true north. We have to be willing to offer our whole selves to him before we can even begin to change the little things in our day-to-day lives. And this is something we're called to do over and over and over again. This is not a one-time decision. It's not, it, did, it happened, you did this when you gave your life to God, but it has to be done daily. And I want to give you the chance to do that tonight. I know I need to myself. So if you would like to, to do that, to surrender, to offer your whole self, not for anyone else, not for me so that I feel good about my cool sermon, but for you, I just want you to stand now. This is a sacred moment that you would, before God and before your community, offer your whole self to him as a living sacrifice. I'm just going to have silence for a bit as you, in your heart's bring yourself to him. Holy God, we surrender to you in this moment. We offer you our loves, our desires, our longings, our goals. We offer you our hurt, our pain, our past. We offer you our time, our thoughts. (coughs) In this moment, as we stand before you, we say, take your rightful place in our lives. Take first place in our lives, Lord Jesus. As we offer our whole selves to you, would you send your Holy Spirit? I just pray over each person standing in this room. Would they experience a fresh outpouring of your spirit in Jesus' name in this moment, Lord God. Would you come and move in their hearts as they offer their whole selves to you as a living sacrifice. You are worthy, Lord. You are worthy above all things for from you and for you and through you were all things created. So we offer ourselves to you tonight and we offer ourselves to you in each day that is to come. Come, Lord Jesus. Come and move in this place.